Test one, two, check. All right, for those of you who are in the back who can hear the sound of my voice, we are getting started. Is it, is it off in the back? Can you go get the, get the bull whip out? For those of you who are here at, on time, which is whenever I get behind the pulpit, and then 450. <laughs> 450 in your hymnals. Let's stand. Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Let's stand. We'll sing 450 in our hymnals. There will never be a stream story. Story of the Savior's love divine. Love that brought him from the realms of Four hundred and fifty two in your hymnals. I stand amazed at the presence.
How's everybody doing? This is it, folks. This is the last hurrah here. His last chance before he jumps on the big bird and flies away. So keep that in mind. We're going to take up another offer in just a minute. But I want you to pray for a couple of people. Uh, Dave Spurgeon was in Tiffin, Ohio today, traveled there, and the meeting was canceled from co for COVID. So, but Mark McGahey had two souls saved this morning in his service. So those are your those are your guys. That's your guys. Keep them in prayer. Keep them lifted up. So, uh, Jesse, pray for uh, the offering the tainted money we're going to take up. And uh, thank you, sir. Ben, are we going to do another one? We're going to bring the smoots up or what? Huh? Okay. Twenty-seven in your hymnals. Let's stand and we'll sing two hundred and twenty-seven. The cleansing wave. Twenty-seven. Oh, now I see the cleansing wave, the fountain deep and wide. Two hundred twenty-seven. Oh, now I see the. my Lord, my teacher said, points to his wounded side. The cleansing stream I see, I see, I plunge in, oh, it cleanseth me. Oh, praise the Lord, it cleanseth me. and Sister Major come.
His heart was broken, mine was mended. He became sin, now I am clean. The cross he carried bore my burdens. The nails that held him set me free. His life for mine, his life for mine. How could it ever be that he would die, God's son would die, to save a wretch like me? What love divine. Gave his life for mine. His scars of suffering brought me healing. He spilled his blood to fill my soul. His crown of thorns made me royalty. His sorrow gave me joy. His life for mine, his life for mine. How could it ever be that he would die, God's son would die, to save a wretch like me? his life for mine. He was despised and rejected, stripped of his garment and oppressed. I am loved and accepted, and I wear a robe of righteousness. His life for mine, his life for mine. die, God's son will die, to save a wretch like me, what love divine, he gave his life. Thank you so much. It's, it's been a great week. Um, but Friday night, um, you started right up with, well, I won't say start up, but that first night, you went over uh, Matthew 5, 44, loving your enemies. Um, and that every time I hear that, that portion of scripture, it does something to me because it's hard. Um, but I just, I just want to say, um, you know, I, I, I'm watching saying, man, he, he's not just preaching it, but he's living it. And that, that was special to me. But I went two months in my, in my church. I was sitting in the back. And we get to a point where we think, you know, hey, just because they're Christians, they, you know, they offended me, you know. And I, and I remember praying, I didn't want to get bitter. You know, I didn't want to get out of God's house. I want to serve God no matter what. And I was sit, I sat in the back. Um, this has been quite a few years. I was sitting in the back, and God would bring people in. As they come, come through the door, I would sit back there. I ain't talk to no one um, because they treat me right, you know. I thought I deserved something, I guess. But I would sit back there, and, and God would say, hey, do you love this person? And honestly, kid you not, I would say, no, God, I don't love him. I don't want to love him. I said, God, I don't even like him. Um, and, but when I read that portion of Scripture, seriously, I read that, and I said, God, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? You know, but, but this happened for two months. And then I got to the point where I was like, okay, God, no, I don't like him. I don't love him. I don't want to love him. My flesh won't do it. 
But I said, God, I want you to love them through me. And for two months, and God gave me a love for people. I don't care what, how I'm offended. And I memorized that because it's like when we started, I started quoting it. You know, um, for I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. And that, you know, and I just want to say thank you for that. And the song the kids want to sing, just thinking about your testimony, your family, just hearing those stories with your family. I'm amazed. And kids want to sing this song um, and dedicate it to you. And I'm not going to sign it, Serena. What would it be like when my pain is gone and all the worries of this world just fade away? What would it be like when you call my name in that moment when I see you face to face? to hear you say
I'm still getting hooked up, I guess. Thank you very much. It's a blessing. That's an interesting song. And isn't that be, won't that be something to get there and know that we belong? My, that's a great thought. We belong there. It's home. It's just like being it's a whole lot better home than we have here, obviously. But, you know, I don't, uh, I don't have to knock on the door when I go home. I don't have to ring the doorbell when I go home. I don't even, I got a key, I guess, but I guess I, I found my key to my mansion on Calvary one day. That's a wonderful, wonderful song, great thought. And uh, you, you really did hit a high note there right at the end. I, where I was sitting, you were on your tiptoes, I saw you. <laughs> I, I don't think I could have ever got there in a million lifetimes. Maybe when I get to heaven, I don't know. A lot, of, a lot of things be better when we get up there. I, uh, I don't want to be lengthy, and I don't want to be so brief that it's, uh, you know, you've, some of you stayed around all afternoon, and some of you have traveled back. And uh, I want to just give you a little something to, uh, I trust will be a help and a blessing to your life. I heard a story the other day. I think I'd heard it a long, long time ago, but I reheard it. It was about a man who was Christian. For whatever reason, he played the lottery. And uh, he won, won $200 million. He was kind of an elderly fellow, and he didn't really know that he had won. His family d discovered it way before he did. And they really got concerned about how in the world am I gonna, are we going to tell Gramps uh, he'll be so shocked it, it could kill him. And so they decided they'd have their pastor come over and tell him that he'd won this $200 million. So the pastor came over, and they talked for a little bit, talked about the weather, talked a little bit about this, a little bit about that. And finally, the pastor he kind of fell on this idea. He said, uh, brother, he said, what would you do if you happened to win $200 million in the lottery? He said, oh, pastor, I'd give you half of it. And the pastor dropped dead right there on the spot. <laughs> so I don't know if that's true or not, but I, but I heard that the other day, so I thought you might like it. I want you to look, if you would, to, to the last verse in the book of Colossians, chapter 4 and verse number 18. I thank the church for hospitality and for the meals that I've enjoyed and the fellowship that we've had in this building. And uh, I pray that the Lord has helped somebody along the road of life in some area uh, that's been addressed in these few days uh, that we're together. And there's a little phrase in this 18th chapter that I want to talk about, but this is, uh, of course, the end of this chapter, end of this book. And Paul said, the salutation by my hand of me, Paul, remember my bonds, grace be with you, amen. Now, of course, this was written from Rome. It was uh, delivered by a couple of fellows to this church of Colossians. And the key thought that I want to talk to you about uh, today is a little phrase, remember my bonds. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the good days that we've enjoyed here in this part of the world, in this church, and with your people. Uh, that have been faithful. Some have been to every service. Some have been to every service they could get to. And I pray that you'd bless them. I pray that you would supply the needs of this church. pray you'd have your good hand of grace upon it. I pray that souls would be saved and people would come into the fellowship that would yoke up and go to work and labor in this vineyard. It's uh, really a fertile field. There's uh, just... Look out on the road today. They're coming and going, hither and yon, back and forth, by the thousands. And I pray, Lord, you'd give us the opportunity to reach some with the gospel of Jesus Christ. See them grow and see them become valuable servants in the work of God. Pray you bless Brother Joseph and strengthen him, help him, and give him a great wisdom and functioning here at this place of service that you've assigned to him. Bless his family. Bless the church family. 
We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk to you about that little phrase, remember my bonds. And I want you to think about it in this light. Uh, think about the bonds that he was in limited what he could do. And I want you to think about, I don't want you to use them as a crutch. I don't want you to use them as an excuse. But think about those things in your life that limit you doing perhaps what you want to do and are surely capable of doing. But there are things that uh, hold us back, that keep us from being uh, what we ought to be. I used to preach at a boy's home out west. I uh, was there every year. Uh, the pastor that was there, the fellow that run that thing, I don't know. I think he came to hear Jim White and I. Uh, Jim White and I, was a, Jim was a wonderful preacher, and some of you know him, and uh, probably the most humorous man I've ever heard in a pulpit, uh, who would also say something. He could wrap his humor and give you a little shot, too, at the same time. But a wonderful brother. We were good friends. But we preached together in Oklahoma City. And uh, this man heard us, and so he wanted to have a camp meeting. So Jim White and I, we were the only, we were the two speakers that night for a long, long time uh, at that particular ministry. But there was a boy there that worked. His name was Kevin. I think Kevin was probably in his 20s. And Kevin had... Uh, something had happened to him when he was born. Uh, some, uh, he, anyway, I don't want to go into the medical terms that I have written down because everybody doesn't, and there's young people here, and so I don't want to talk about that. But he, when he was born, he, uh, it was a lack of oxygen for an extended period of time, and he was not the sharpest boy. He had some limitations. He had some mental uh, limitations. He had some physical limitations. He had some speech limitations. But he did what he could with what he had, and he served. And all of us in this room, to some extent, may have a physical, mental, uh, whatever uh, limitation. And so I want to talk to you about that for just a little bit uh, this afternoon. The thing that I'd like you to consider initially, is be mindful of others' limitations. And in doing so, receive in kind, be mindful of my limitations, uh, shortcomings that I might have uh, in my life, uh, to put it in modern day vernacular, at least when I was a teenager, uh, cut me some slack, uh, uh, give me a break. Don't expect out of everybody uh, what you expect out of other people. Uh, you know, some things I used to do, I can't do anymore. We used to have a man that went to our church uh, in Michigan. His name was uh, Grover Cook, and I've probably mentioned Grover in this pulpit before. But Grover, when he was a boy, uh, they lived way up in northern Michigan. They worked, he had a farm. His parents did, I should say. He worked on it. And uh, the kids were playing one day in a barn. They would, uh, with a pulley, they would pull a wagon, an old wooden wagon, up to the top of the barn and swing back and forth. And however it happened, I don't know, Grover somehow fell out of that wagon, fell the 20, 30 feet to the barn floor, and he was never the same since. He had a physical problem. He talked kind of funny, he walked kind of funny, acted kind of funny. But he was a faithful member at my dad's church, and uh, he would come to everything. He'd come to every service. He would come to every revival meeting. He would come to every special that we had. He probably even went to the ladies' meetings. I don't know. He went to everything. And he would come to visitation. Never miss, never miss soul winning visitation. Dad would move it around. Sometimes it'd be Thursday night. Sometimes it'd be Monday night. Sometimes it'd be Tuesday night. We always had Saturday visitation for the buses, tried to get kids to ride Sunday school buses, had a big bus ministry way back in the day. But uh, Rover came to everything. And so when he'd come to visitation, uh, nobody really wanted to go with him because he wasn't necessarily the most well-dressed. He wasn't the most positive-looking uh, fella. And uh, he was just Grover. But everybody loved him, but they didn't want to go with him. And so I would go with him. I took him probably half the time that he came. 
uh, basically because I was on staff way back when and I had to go visit them just about every day or I could go every day if something else wasn't going on. So it was not a problem. So I, I took him. And um, we went to a, a couple of streets, a couple of dead end streets, probably 10 houses on each street. We knocked on every door, invited him to church, witnessed to him. We came to the last house. I did all the talking, all the other, let's say 18, 19 houses. I came to the last house and uh, I said, Grover, why don't you take this one? And, and I'm not gonna mimic how he talked. I, I don't make, I, I, I don't try not to make fun of people, but he didn't talk real plain. And so he went to the door and, and uh, introduced me, introduced himself and said uh, the church was called Parker Memorial Baptist Church. And, and so he said that, and we'd like to invite you to church. And the lady uh, behind the screen door, she said, well, we're Jehovah Witnesses. And Rover paused for maybe two or three beats, and he looked at her and he said, well, that's too bad, and turned around. And I'm standing there, and I said, well, I'm going with Grover. I guess it is too bad. But he had some limitations. Now, I don't know, it might have been the most effective witness of the night. <laughs> he may have done better than anybody else. But when we have these limitations in our lives, these, these things that people can see or people know about or uh, personal things in our life, uh, be mindful of them in others, and I trust that you'll be mindful of them in me. We all have those kind of things. Um, there's two kinds of sin. You know, sometimes sin is a, limit, a limitation, especially when that sin is not confessed and forsaken. If we confess and forsake our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all sin, from all unrighteousness, if we'll confess it and forsake it. A lot of people confess and go right ahead and do the same thing. Uh, God forgive me for lying, but I'm going to lie tomorrow. Uh, God forgive me for stealing, but I'm going to steal again tomorrow. That's not the kind of forgiveness that gets forgiven. That's not the kind of, I guess, confession that gets forgiven. It's confessing and forsaking that gets God's forgiveness. Uh, I gave this illustration to my son Jordan because I thought it fit him so well. Uh, and Jordan's been here. This church supports him, and I'm grateful uh, for that. The checks come every month, first of the month usually, from this church. And uh, I heard a guy give it in a meeting. We were preaching a conference somewhere in a very, very large church, and he gave uh, this illustration. He told about a, a kid that was born uh, without uh, one of his arms. I don't recall if it was right or left, but he was born with just one arm. And that, that is a, a limiting thing. Jordan, of course, is paralyzed. His right arm is paralyzed. Nothing works on his right hand uh, but his little finger. You probably wouldn't, you know, most people maybe not even notice uh, that fact, that's a lot different than not having an arm, but uh, he had a stroke, and you know the story. But anyway, uh, maybe y'all don't know the story, but ask somebody who knows the story, and they'll tell you afterwards. <laughs> I don't have time to give it to you. But uh, this kid, you know, he wanted to do something. His parents wanted him to get involved in sports, but that makes it difficult. And so they got him in some uh, type of martial arts, and I don't remember uh, what type of martial art it was. You know, there's kung fu and there's jujitsu and, and all these different things and a whole lot of other names that I don't know. Uh, but he got involved in it. And so uh, in his particular weight class, uh, he became very effective with this particular move that his uh, coach taught him and taught him and taught him and taught him. And, and the kid would ask every once in a while, Coach, I'd like to learn something else. Huh? I, I, I'm tired of just learning this one, uh, this one move all the time. He said, I just want you to keep doing it. Just get real good at this. And so the kid did. And, he, and up through the ranks, he, he would win match after match after match. Finally, this boy uh, got to the world championship in whatever type of uh, martial arts this is. And uh, he got in the finals. He was uh, involved in, in a match against an individual they were obviously within the same weight class, and uh, got involved in that thing, and he won. He won the world championship in that particular uh, brand of uh, martial arts. 
And so on the way home with the big trophy, he said to his coach, he said, I want to ask you two questions. He said, why in the world did you make me just learn those, that one move, that one particular thing? And the coach said, well, it's because I knew that I felt like that you could become uh, one of the best in the world at that particular move, and, and, and I believe you were. He said, Coach, I got another question. Uh, besides, there, there must be something else. And the coach said, yes, there was. He said, the only defense against that move is that your opponent has to grab your other arm, and you didn't have one. So his limitation turned out to be the thing that brought him success. And sometimes our physical impairments or our situational things, uh, they don't have to be a deterrent to us amounting to something for Jesus Christ. Listen, God can use our nothingness and make something wonderful out of our nothing if we just give him our nothing, give him what we have, give him what we are. Paul said, remember my bonds, remember this situation that I'm in. Now, Paul was in prison. You know that. Uh, he wasn't lollygagging around doing absolutely nothing. Uh, in Philippians chapter 2, and, or excuse me, Philippians chapter uh, 1 and verse 13, he talked about being in the bonds. He talked about being in the palace. He talked about what went on there. And in chapter 4 and verse 22, uh, there were people from Caesar's household that the apostle Paul had won to Christ. Uh, he wasn't down in the, the Mamertine prison you know, up to his knees in, in muck. He was an, under house arrest most of the time. There were guards that would guard him. Uh, you, I don't know, what do you think the Apostle Paul talked to those guards about when they, when they came? You know, they, the changing of the guards every four hours or six hours or whatever. He witnessed to them. He talked to them about the claims of Christ and how they could be born again and be freed uh, from their sin. And I would imagine, God only knows how many of them he won to Christ. Could you imagine you know, you're there, Apostle Paul, and this is the first day, and you come, and he witnesses to you, and so it's time for a shift change, and you walk out, and another guy's walking in, and the guy walking in says, what's it like? He said, you ain't going to believe it. Wait till you get there. And he won people, and he won people, and he won people uh, to the Lord in spite of his bonds. Remember, be mindful of my limitations. Then I want you to consider this little thought. Be mindful of my lack of control over the situation. There's a lot of things we can't control in life. We can't do anything about them. They just happen. Uh, there's things you can control, obviously, and things that just get beyond us. Now, let's just have a little question and answer. I would say 99% of you know the answer. Where was the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 16? He was in him and Paul and Silas. They were in jail. They were in jail. What were they doing? Griping and complaining? Uh, trying to get a hold of their lawyers so they could get out? No, they're singing and praising God. And so uh, the earthquake comes and the fetters fall off and the uh, guard, the uh, captain of the guard, he's about ready to kill himself. And Paul said, hold it, we're all here, don't kill yourself. And in a few minutes, he leads that fellow of the Lord. They get out of prison, they go over and he wins the guy's whole family uh, to Christ, they all get baptized. I think he's probably uh, the man by the name of Silvanus, because Paul only, he mentions a couple guys he baptized, and then he goes a couple more verses, and he said, oh yeah, I did baptize the household of Silvanus, so he's probably, uh, that was probably that guy's name. So where is he in Acts chapter 23? He's back in prison. But you don't hear him singing. You don't hear him doing anything. And you don't hear another thing about the Apostle Paul until Acts chapter 24 and verse number 27, and it's referred to as the silent years. It's strange. Be mindful of my control. There's some things I can work my way through, and there's some other things that just get beyond me. Let me give you another question this afternoon. How many times did Paul get whipped? Uh, 39 times. Five, five times. That's a lot. Do the math. That's a lot of, he took a lot of lickings, man. He had it pretty tough. And uh, he just suffered it, got through it. 
But when you get to Acts chapter 22, and they're about to do the same thing, Paul said, hold it, boys. Uh, is it okay to whip a Roman? And they said, no, we can't do that. He said, I'm a Roman. And, and one of the guys said, well, you know, my father bought it with a great price. And Paul said, I was freeborn. He one-upped him a little bit. I don't know, I've got a better relationship as a Roman than you do. So one time he took it, and another time he didn't take it. I used to preach at a place, and um, emphasis on the used to. Uh, I preached a sermon that the, the pastor didn't like. Maybe like this one, I don't know. But I, I preached this sermon. I was, uh, I know this, I was 46 years old when I preached it, so it was quite a while ago. And I've never been back since. And I preached there probably for 15 years in a row, uh, but he, he got upset, he got mad about this sermon. But I preached this message, and uh, I was 46 years old, there's a hint. How long did it take to rebuild the temple? What did Jesus say? 46 years. 46 years. So I was 46 years old in uh, whatever year that was. So it took a lifetime. Because it took my lifetime when I was 46 to build that temple that Jesus was standing in there in Jerusalem. And... Uh, how many, how many years did it take to build the walls back around Jerusalem? It took two years. That's all it took. So I made this statement in preaching this message. I said, when, when we first get saved, we are so pliable. We, we want to do everything that the Bible tells us to do, everything the preacher tells us to do. We, we just want to do it. We, 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 haven't, we haven't gotten to the place in our lives yet where we can do what we want to do. And, and we look at other Christians who have been saved 15, 20 years, and they're not doing what the pastor says, so I guess I don't have to do what the pastor says. Or better yet, I see people have been saved 30 or 40 years, they don't do what the Bible says, so I guess I don't have to do what the Bible says. I didn't get an amen there, but oh me. And so my thesis was that when you first get saved, especially those first couple of years, man, you get your standards you get the, how I'm going to live my life, how I'm going to conduct a fair, I'm going to quit my drinking, I'm going to quit my cussing, I'm going to quit my smoking, I'm going to quit all this, I'm going to quit that. I mean, I'm, I'm going to put these walls around my life to protect me, and we're so sensitive about it. We want to do right. We want to be clean. We want to live a life that's pleasing to God. And so you get to those, you get that, taken care of real quick. But what is our temple? Our bodies. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And it's a continuous uh, work on our spiritual temple on the inside to be what God would have us to be. I don't think any of us have arrived. I don't think any of us have gotten to the place where we're perfect. Ask my wife if you would like to know anything further about that, and thank God she's not here. We all got a long ways to go. We all need to keep, you know, if it took those Jews 46 years to build that Solomon's temple there, my goodness, it might take us uh, our entire lifetimes. God, keep working on me and help me to be flexible and pliable and do what you would have me to do in my life. Be mindful of my limitations. Be mindful of my lack of control over things. And let me give you the last thought. Be mindful that I am the Lord's servant. And I'm going to be mindful that you are the Lord's servant. I, I, and this is a pet peeve with me, and I don't, you know, Brother uh, Joseph can do whatever, whatever he wants to do. He can talk about it, the church folk any way he wants to. But you know what really bothers me? People, you know, talking to preachers privately, they'll say, well, my people. My people over here. I'm going to tell you, I've never pastored a church, but I don't think the people in the pew are my people. I think we all belong to him if we're saved. We belong to God. And, you know, sometimes it's difficult as a pastor to have to turn some people over to the Lord to have him work some things out of their life that need to be worked out of them. I'm, 
Again, I've, I've lived in a pastor's home for a long time, and I've spent my time with pastors. Most of my fellowship is with pastors. Be mindful that I am the Lord's servant. If you looked across the page in your book in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. Uh, Paul said, I, I, I know who you are. I know what you are in Christ. I know what he's done for you. Same thing that he's done for me. Be mindful that I am the Lord's servant. I, I love Deuteronomy chapter 15 and verse 15. It says, remember, he said, remember that thou wast a bondman in Egypt. You know, one thing that I think that would help us Christians to be the kind of Christians that we ought to be, if we could somehow remember that one day we were in Satan's grasp. One day we were in bondage to the world. We were in bondage to Egypt. And God wanted the children of Israel to know that he had delivered them by his mighty hand uh, through the Red Sea and all of the things that he did for the children of Israel as he brought, brought them into the promised land. And you think about it in your own life, how God has brought you out of the bondage of Egypt, and one of these days we're going to be delivered into the promised land. And we'll be home. We'll be home. We'll be welcome home. We'll not be strangers in that fair land. I'm thankful that God put me in the ministry. I'm thankful that God gave me something to do for him. And every single Christian in this room tonight, God has given you something to do. He's given you a task, given you a job. You say, well, I don't know. I, I can't do this. I can't do that. You can do something. Uh, there's a couple of boys around here, young boys. I've noticed this about them. When we get out of the car, we can't even get the door open. They're out there opening the door. You know, if it's cold in the wintertime, don't be so fast. <laughs> We're going to freeze to death. And there's, a, there's a, often a young boy uh, standing at the door and opening the door for us old people uh, to come in. That's just, they can't, you know, kids can't, they can't do everything. Uh, but they can, op you can open a door. You can find some task, some thing to do. Somebody can go around and uh, straighten up the hymn books, or somebody can go, you know, make sure the chairs are all straight. Or so I, and there's another young boy. I've watched him every night after the service, even this morning. Probably shouldn't have done it this morning, but he, he cut off all the air conditioners and pulled the hoses out. It probably been cooler tonight. It's really hot up here. I don't know if it's hot out there, but and and I notice some people sit right by those things too. Some smart people, I guess. I don't know. Uh, God help us to find something that we can do, even though we have limitations, even though there's something that perhaps uh, is beyond what we think we can do. We all can do something in the work of God. Paul said, remember my bond. Remember the situation uh, that I'm stuck in. Remember the circumstances of my life. I had another preacher, a big shot preacher, if I called his name, everybody in the room would know him. And uh, we preached together at a college graduation in a big college uh, several years ago. And uh, I preached this. And I really didn't preach it, was just an illustration, basically. But he got up that night and correct, you know, why in the world? I have never, God being my witness with my hand on the Bible and the other one raised to heaven, I have never followed a speaker in my life that I didn't like what he said, and I, I didn't agree with what he said, but I have never gotten in the pulpit and straightened him out. It's not my, it's he, again, he's God's servant. I'll go way back, and i got to quit. I uh, was invited to preach at a college, excuse me, no, at the, at the fellowship meeting of the college I graduated from. And uh, the pastor was a friend of mine, Matter of fact, the first time I'd ever preached out uh, any place besides my father's church uh, was this guy's church. And so they had this big meeting, a bunch of preachers there, I don't know, probably 40 or 50 of them. And they didn't tell me there was a time limit. 
And there was a guy that preached before me, so I figured, you know, it's a little bit before 11, and we're going to go eat at noon. It's like, man, I guess they're giving me an hour. He didn't bother to tell me there were four speakers after me. So I preached, I don't know, probably until 1130. I didn't know. I'm just a kid preacher. I'm 22, 23 years old, just a baby. And uh, all four of those guys up made it, got up after me and made a fool of me. Just made a fool of me. Said terrible things about me. Many, many years passed. And uh, I, I quit going to that. I never went to that fellowship for probably 35, 40 years. Now I went to it. I was invited to speak at uh, in Michigan one, 40 years after that incident. And when I got up, I made the statement. I said, I told just basically what I just told you. And I said, I've never been back. And an old man, old preacher stood up. Said about where this brother's sitting right there. With tears flowing down his cheek. He said, I was there that day. I heard what they did to Brother Green. It was wrong, blah, blah, blah. And I didn't need that for validation. Because maybe I needed to be humbled. Maybe I needed to, you know, I didn't know you weren't supposed to preach forever. <laughs> you know, just get them preach. But uh, I don't know how I even got talking about that. Oh, they got mad at me about that. So what? Just, just keep on going. Don't, don't let anything impede your progress with God. Oh, back to this college uh, graduation day. I preach this. In 1 Timothy... And 2 Timothy, Paul uh, starts out those, he says, Paul, an apostle. That's his salutation. So you get to Titus, and he starts it out, Paul, a servant. Now, an apostle is a, you know, a little bit higher accolade, <clears throat> nice label, good badge to have on, Paul, apostle. But when he gets to Titus, the next book, he said, Paul, a servant. Servants are not quite as important as apostles. And you get to Philemon, the next book, and he says, Paul, a prisoner. There's a lot more limitation on a prisoner than there is a servant, even though a servant has a lot more limitations than an apostle. But when you get to the book of Hebrews, and I lean to the fact that he wrote the book of Hebrews, he just talks about God. And my, my thesis was, you know, when we start out here, we're thinking we really got something, then we realize we're this, and then we're a little bit lower, and finally when you get right down to it, it's just God. And if we can just get to the place in our lives where we belong to him and we want to do what he wants us to do in spite of the bonds that we might have, in spite of the limitations that we might have to go through in life, we can all serve God. Here's my last little statement. I don't want to allow my limitations to limit what God wants to do in my life. I don't want to let my real limitations, my preconceived limitations, I don't want my, I don't want to allow my limitations to limit what God wants to do in my life. Just let God work. Father, we thank you for these few minutes uh, this afternoon. I thank you for these folk listening. I know it's hard to stay awake. I know I didn't get my nap this afternoon. I hope I get one on the plane flying home. But Lord, I pray that you'd help us. You know, I think sometimes we use our limitations as a crutch. I think sometimes we use our limitations as a reason not to do anything. And this precious church, they support a crippled boy of mine down in Mexico. He hasn't let his limitations keep him from doing what he felt like God would have him do. You may have some limitations in your family. You may have experienced some negative things across the path of your life. I know people who have suffered greatly. I I was talking to our brothers. We were coming to church tonight. Lord, you know my brother I'm praying about right now. He's not my physical brother, but a dear brother. Well, I'm going to stop praying. Just keep your head bowed. And tell you what I told him. I had a preacher friend. He's having problems with his wife. 
he told me, these are new problems. They're the same problems, but they're new. They're coming back and probably never went away. But he said, I've been at the point at that time he'd been preaching 30 years. He said, Preacher, I've ridden home in my wife from church for 30 years. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. She's never one time said, Preacher, that's a good message. I got something out that. I think that helped the people tonight, brother, or pastor, or honey, or whatever. Not one time has she gave him a positive statement about his preaching at that time for 30 years. She'd criticized him, told him what a big liar he was, giving him all kind of diatribes against what he been trying to do in the will of God. And yet, with that limitation, he stayed faithful. Stayed faithful. I have preached in that church, their anniversary week, every year until this year. I had to cancel because my wife had COVID. And I couldn't leave her. We all have some limitations. God help us not to let them keep us from doing what God wants to do with our lives. Father, we ask these things in the name of our lovely Lord Jesus, who saved us, who shed his blood on Calvary as it's been sung night after night in this meeting and talked about in sermon after sermon. We're thankful tonight for the saving grace of God. And I pray you'd bless, bless us here in this building this evening. Bless them as the days go by. Supply the needs of this work in a wonderful and unique manner. I pray you'd give us safety as we travel and as I travel home tonight. And all the things that we have to do in the coming week, bless these folk. Many of them have to get up early in the morning tomorrow and hit the, hit the road again at the job. I pray you'd bless them. We ask it in Christ's name. been a good few days. One of the things I really enjoy about Brother Tim is he'll come in and he'll pull some things that we never think about. Everybody has limitations. I don't care who you think you are. Um, I, I have quite a few. <laughs> but you know what? Thank God you can take what you have and by the grace of God and give it to him. Um, I find Christians sometimes are, I don't want to say critical, but work on, you know, sort of look down their nose to others. And uh, I've always thought, I better keep my mouth shut. Lord, like, Lord will put me in that saddle and let me see how that rides. Amen. Um, if you have anything that you excel in, it's all because of him. Amen. Um, but that's what I'm saying. He'll come up with some topics that just baffle you. It's like, well, I'm not, I'm not really thinking about that. But if you've got a talent, you got it from God. Amen. Amen. Now, the thing you want to do is use that for God. But you don't want to look down your nose at someone else because maybe God gave them something different that you don't have. Amen. I don't want to be belabored. I know he's got to catch a plane relatively early, but um, it's been a good meeting. Um, um, pray for um, Adrian's uh, mom, sister. Uh, uh, come up with the name, Bob. <laughs> Miriam, thank you. She's not been doing too good this past week. Um, been about a week, Adrian. Yeah. So pray for her uh, that uh, Lord will at least disclose to the doctors what the problem is. Uh, she's up and then she's down. And um, 
I, I don't know if she battles sinuses, but this is about the time of the year that my head goes crazy. And I, I've literally, <laughs> literally stood and I was preaching and blood started running down my mind. So I took a, a Kleenex and stuffed it up my nose and went ahead and preached. What else are you going to do? Say you look funny. I look a lot funnier getting down. So I wasn't going to let that deter me. But let Brother Tim know what a blessing that was that came. I, did you get something? Amen. Now, some of you, <laughs> you're, you're not that old. I, I think I'm older than anybody in this place. Don't lose your shout. You know what? It becomes contagious. Um, I, I'll do <laughs> I'm done. I think I watched down in Bible, and people go crazy. Um, took the choir down there one time. I thought they were going to tear the place apart. But Dr. Ruckman, when he got excited, he didn't shout. He punched. So Buddy Cargill, I don't know if he ever told you, Buddy Cargill got all excited, and, and Buddy, just big old barrel belly anyway, runs up and grabs Dr. Ruckman, picks him up. And Dr. Ruckman was much shorter than Buddy. His feet were dangling. <laughs> and he's punching Buddy <laughs> in the stomach. You say, well, that's crazy. Yeah, well, every once in a while, it'd be good for you to act a fool for Jesus Christ. Amen? Yeah, do, good, do yourself well. It'll be a blessing. All right, let's get dismissed, and I'll let you guys. Brother Tim has a plane to catch. And uh, please let him know. Thank him for coming. Uh, pray for him, pray for the ministry, pray for his wife, um, pray for his family. Um, I, I've never seen a family where God uses so many of them, but thank God for them. Amen? All right, let's stand. Brother Chuck, would you dismiss us, please?